If you've got cows, you're going to understand this. If you don't, I think you're still going to understand it. So yesterday, and this has been like a week-long problem, um, my dad's got a herd, and I've got a herd, and got a bull in with each one, and there's just one bar bar between. Any of you that know how that works knows that that's not the best situation. So the bulls get to pushing on each other through the fence, and they don't really notice the fence. So about a week ago, we managed to get them separated and got them locked off into another uh, pasture. Day before yesterday, I noticed all of them were back out. So yesterday, um, I loaded Eli up, and we're we're going to go move Dad's cows and get out of there. See, check fence. I mean, we had other areas of fence that were down that I've had to fix because trees blew over and lots of things going on. Um, I was thinking about these bulls. The only thing they were doing is following their natural desire. They were just doing what they did. So we're down and we're looking at this part of the fence that it was a wooden fence post that, that had snapped in half and the fence was laying down. And so we started to repair that. And up on the hill towards the house, I could hear the bulls start yelling at each other. All righty, we're going to leave this for now. Let's go get the bull out of there. After he How easy rattled a bucket. rattled a bucket and here comes this bull from almost eighth of a mile away all of the ladies that were on his side of the fence came with him so here comes this this whole herd we actually did have something in the bucket uh, so I gave the bucket to Eli so he goes through the fence and all the cows <laughs> Right? Hey, he's he's bigger than me. He's bigger than me, right? Uh, so he goes through the fence, and all the cows are kind of mobbing around, and the bull's rubbing on him, wanting more grain. And there's about five or six that wouldn't go through the gap. Though. They wanted to, but they wouldn't go. Watching me, and you all know if you've worked around cows, anybody unfamiliar, they get kind of nervous. So I ended up having to chase them around in the side-by-side -side for a while until I got them funneled back through, and I got, all got on the right side, and we closed that gap, and then we went down and fixed. You don't need all the deal. Here's what hit me, though. The bulls were following their natural desires, even following the bucket. Right? The bucket was enough to even draw him away from what he was interested in to something else he was interested in. But there were still some that would not go through the fence where the place where it was best for them. And I'm just thinking about how often I am guided by my natural desires. And I'm pushing back against God's desire. Too busy either wrestling through a fence or following my stomach. Or whatever it might be, right? Just thinking about how powerful those desires can be. Follow. Most of the time, we don't realize what's best for us. We think we know. Turns out God's the one who has done. That's what we get to celebrate here. And as we go into the word here in just a minute, we're going to be in the Johns, the little John. But it amazes me out in how you can be doing something so routine. We're just moving cows and fixing fence. Yet God taught me something. He wasn't teaching me about how to whisper to cows to get them to do what I wanted about me, about my desires, about how rebellious and disobedient I can be. 
Oh, he's asking me. To Father God, we just thank you so much that you are so good. God, how you can use such ordinary day-to-day -day activity sometimes to teach us lessons that make Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that we know we can always go to your word when we are certain. Father, that you will give us. I thank you so much. Jesus, for your finished work. This is the time of year that we celebrate your birth. But through your life, sacrifice, death, and resurrection, given, you made a way for us. So that help us to celebrate. Just the Christmas season, every Father, we pray for so many who are dealing with sicknesses right now. So many things going on. God, we pray for your protection and your healing upon them. God, we thank you so much to celebrate the birth of two new There are so many others that are being born into families, God, and Celebrate. God, we ask that you would give us direction. God, we need your strength. This is a season of peace and joy and gladness, but God brings an extra sorrow. With you. You see family members, the relationships that are broken. God, we ask for comfort. Additional sorrow. Which your Holy Spirit would be present with. Fill your comfort. And we thank you so much just for this morning that we could gather together your name as your children. We could celebrate, we could honor you, praise you, we could worship you. And we do pray that. All that we do here today and the days to come would bring on everything that we say, all that we do. Ask your Holy Spirit to guide this time with us. Thank you. It's the gift of laughter. Thank you for relationship. Of all, love. Father, there are many in this world suffering so terribly. And there's lost and hurt and all around us. And I pray, Father, that you give us eyes to see each situation. Look at each situation from your perspective, God. Love those around us. Generous, giving, passionate, and loving. Father, your word tells us to make the most of every opportunity strength. Just give you all. Praise you. We pray that what we say and do here together is pleasing to you. And we pray for travel mercies and for protection and safety for family. God, I just pray that relationships would be strengthened strained. Father, the stress and anxiety and uncertainty that sometimes come with these things, Father, would be set aside and be time. And we cannot. I pray that you teach us to serve you that our lives given attitude courage Never lose sight. Praise you. Love you.
thank you. Sake. <clears throat> Some of you were pretty excited when I started talking this morning because voice is obviously not back where it should be. Some some of you may have mistakenly jumped to the conclusion that I'm going to be short with this today. I might. I don't know. We'll see how I hold out. But I do have two weeks worth saved up, right? <clears throat> so here's <clears throat> where we're at today. We're in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. As we're working through the New Testament. And so next week, we're going to be in Revelation. Okay? And actually, as a side note, um, first of the year, we're going to start back into the Old Testament. There are reading plans printed out back here for those of you who like one uh, for next year. So we'll be working through the Old Testament together next year. Um, but here's what's exciting to me. This is one thing that I want us to realize together as we go through the Old Testament. The Old Testament isn't just a collection of old stories. right? It's a historical account that continually continually to Jesus Christ. So though we are going to be in the Old Testament for most of our readings next year, it's still going to be all about. So you've got plans back there that you can help yourself to. So 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 1st um, John is just five chapters. 2nd and 3rd John are just a chapter apiece. So I could just read all of that to you this morning and we call it good, but... <clears throat> I actually just have a small passage from 1 John chapter 1 into chapter 2 that I want to read, and that's really what I want to focus on. But to just give you an update or a backstory of the little Johns, okay? Excuse the expression. That's just how, how I keep it straight in my head, okay? Um, 1 through 3 John is really just a short collection of uh, sermons or letters, okay? They're written more in a sermon format than a letter, but a couple of them do have addresses, so they were sent as letters, but they're really likely most uh, first distributed to the early church communities in meeting in homes in Ephesus. Um, first John is actually anonymous. We don't have the, the author written in. Uh, and second, third John is just written by someone identified as the elder, just identifies himself as the elder. Uh, but the writing style for all three of these is nearly identical to the Gospel of John. And they actually contain the same themes as John's gospel, and they provide an amazing summary of it, just within these first these three short letters. So in any case, these letters have been attributed to the Apostle John, who also wrote the Gospel of John and Revelation. And they were likely written to um, a Jewish community <coughs> or a Christ-professing Jewish community in the Ephesus area. And they've just experienced kind of an early church split. So what's happened is there were many who had initially professed Christ as Messiah, but then they would end up leaving the church and denying that He is Messiah and Son of God. Not only did they just leave, and here was part of the problem that John was really getting at. They didn't just leave. They didn't just change their mind and leave. They really began to try to stir up hostility and discontent among those who were remaining faithful. So they didn't just unconfess, if that's even a thing, okay? They didn't just recant or deny their faith. They were trying to take others with them. That was a big problem. John wasn't very um, enthusiastic about that plan. So he wrote these letters primarily for this purpose. So I just want to start by say, uh, reading in 1 John chapter 1. I'm going to read verse, start with verse 5, and I'm going to go through chapter 2, verse 6. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship in, with him while we walk in darkness, we lie, do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we've not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments is a liar. Truth is not. Whoever keeps His word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever says He abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. Pretty strong words. Pretty strong words. And this is how I would summarize all this in my Vernon Cedar County vernacular. Got to walk your talk. He's basically saying, listen, if we say it, we should do it. And he deals a lot with lying. Did you pick that up? He's talking about lying and this may seem like a strange Christmas message. That's really what we're going to talk about. It's the circumstance of sin, deception. Here's the nature of sin. It's very persuasive, and it's very secretive. It's very easy to commit. Sin is very easy to commit. It's very hard to admit. It's easy to do. It's hard to admit that we've done. So we have this sin in our lives, and, and Scripture over and over reminds us that this is a problem, right? Paul says, none are righteous. All have sinned. He says, we're all in the same spot. We've all had sin in our lives or are continually dealing with sin. In our lives. But it's really our attitude towards sin that affects our attitude towards Christ. And I'm looking at these that initially professed Christ in these Jewish communities in Ephesus, and then they would change their minds and decide, no, that's, that's not the case, but it's not just enough for me to change my mind. I want you to change your mind too. What is that? I mean, we've all heard the phrase, misery loves company, right? I truly believe that those people came to a place where they were miserable. They were miserable. They were so discontent or unsettled in themselves that they couldn't stand to see someone else be happy or find a place of joy. We deal with sin in, really, we have two options. We can either deal with sin in a worldly way Godly way. Here's the problem. Deal with worldly. You don't have to have kids to get this. If you've ever been around kids, you know what I'm talking about. We ever have to teach children, toddlers, we ever have to teach them how to lie? Does anybody, okay, don't raise your hand if this True. Has it, but rhetorical, right? Has anybody ever taught a child how to lie? Like a two-year-old breaks something or takes something, wants to eat something that they know they're not supposed to have, right? And you catch them doing it. What's their first response? Do they ever just say, yep, you got me. I was doing it. If they've got something they're not supposed to have, what do they do? They hide it, or they lie about it. No, it wasn't me. No, Daddy said I could. No, Daddy didn't. We don't have to teach that. That's in our nature. It's in our sinful nature from birth. It's our default setting. Now, that makes you feel good about everybody sitting next to you, doesn't it? 
Lying, deception, self-preservation is our default. We don't have to teach them to lie. And the problem is, without Jesus Christ, we never really outgrow that. We never outgrow that juvenile, childish response to the wrong that we've done. We just get a little more sophisticated about it. We get better at hiding it. We get better at blaming others. We get better at denying. Hiding is our first response. From a worldly perspective, and we start by lying to others. It just says this in verse 6 in chapter 1. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say one thing, but we know we're doing it, we're just lying. We lie to others. We tell others, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm walking in light. But that's just coming out of our mouths. It's not coming out of our lives. We lie to others. That's how we start. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I found this fascinating and disturbing at the same time. I was reading a study. For, and this was uh, been about three years ago. I was just reading it recently. The study's from three years ago, okay, from 2018. <clears throat> A study discovered that lying actually alters our memories, changes the way we were. This is even worse. They found that we can begin to believe our own lies as little time as four. They would have people tell an intentional lie, and then they would perpetuate that, and sometimes within less than an hour, they would sincerely believe that's the case. That's how susceptible we are. Deception can alter our brain wave, the way we think. Five minutes. I've got a quick remedy for that. Go to the Word ASAP. Got a lie that's rolling around in your head. Don't just sit on it and chew on it and think, well, you know, wrestle with it. The word. What's God say about it? You've got 45 minutes. Go. We need to be so careful what we believe. How we believe. So we start by lying to others in verse 6, and then verse 8 shows that we then go to lying to ourselves. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I'll tell you this, not a groundbreaking discovery. Realize that our thoughts are not always what you think, what I think is not always. Because what we seem to do is when something comes into our head, we think, well, that... I wouldn't have thought of it if it wasn't true. Our thoughts are not always true. And we say, well, you know, follow your heart. You know, Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our hearts are desperately wicked, full of deception. And this is part of our problem because this is what society does for us. Society doesn't tell us that our thoughts are not always true. Society tells us that they are. Your truth is true. You ever heard that phrase, your truth? I was talking to somebody the other day and they said something and I'm like, I'm not sure that's right. I didn't say that out loud, but I think my face said it. I said, well, it's my truth. We can convince ourselves so many times in situations that we misunderstand something, right? There's always three sides to a story. There's his, his side, her side, and then there's the truth. But we can get in a situation and we can walk away from that and we can think, oh, they're mad at me or he or she doesn't like me or I'm all alone. I don't have any value. I had good reasons to do what I did. It's not hurting anyone. 
Nobody will know. It feels good or it feels right that it must be from God. He just wants me happy. I'm right, you're wrong. We can have these thoughts so easily. Just believe. Now that you're maybe questioning your thoughts, let me throw another uh, curveball at you. Do you know our emotions are not always an accurate reflection of reality? I mean, it's, we can be an emotional people. Some of us are more emotional than others. I get it. But there's an element of emotional response in so many things that we do. I really believe that that's why James wrote in chapter 1, be quick to listen, slow to speak. That doesn't mean talk slow. Okay? Can I say it this way? Keep your mouth shut for a minute. That goes for me first. I can look at so many situations that I've had where I wanted to say something, and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit kept my mouth shut. Looking back, I am so grateful He did, because what I would have said, even though my brain said this was a great thing to say, this is absolutely appropriate, it would not have been. Quick to listen. Slow to anger. It's James 1.19, by the way, that's one of the... Our emotions lie to. Same way. So if what we have within us, what we've had at our disposal our entire lives, some of us longer than others, what do we come to do? We become reliant upon Oh, my gut feeling, or my heart's telling me this, or I know this. Do we? What do we know? It says the only thing that we can know, He speaks truth. Everything else is suspect. So if our thoughts will lie to us and our emotions will lie to us, that's how we hide our sin or our wrongdoing. Or if we don't hide it, what's the next step? I can't hide it, so I'm going to blame somebody else. If I have more than one child in a room when something happens, you hear a crash and you go in there and they've all got wide eyes and they're all pointing at each other. He did it. Wasn't me. No, I didn't say that. Who told you that? No, that's not what I said. Deny it. Hide it, we blame others for it, and then we deny it. Kids, again, right? I'm not picking on kids. This is just, it's so evident to me, I'm, I'm convinced. I've said this before, I'm convinced that God made me a father so I could deal with this type of thing, understand that God's deal that me jail. I can remember, and I'm not going to give names or situation, but I can remember a situation with one of my boys. One of my boys, <clears throat> it was obvious what happened when he came in? The response was, ask him, what happened? You all know what the answer is. I don't know what happened. And I always thought that was the most ridiculous answer, but then I go back and look at Moses coming down off. Remember this? this grown men, Moses comes down off the, off the mountain with the commandments, and Aaron and all the rest of them were doing everything they shouldn't do down below, and they had made the golden calf. And Aaron's response, okay, this is 
a grown man. We just threw the gold in the fire and a calf came out. I don't know what happened. What? You're 80 some years old, Aaron. That's the best you can come up with is I don't know what happened. The two year old response blame others, deny it, or this is where most of us land as adults. Seek validation, support from others. What do you think? I'm right, right? Think I did the right thing? Let me justify it to you and explain all the details on why it couldn't possibly be any other answer. And then you'll agree with me and I'll feel better about it. Hide it, blame it, deny it. It's our natural setting. These are the ways that we deal with wrongdoing, sin. God has an entirely different. Verse 9, chapter 1. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and give us our sins. Cleanse us. Confess it. Well, that sounds easy. You all know that it's not. Here's the problem with confess confession. We have to acknowledge there's a problem in the first place. Can't confess a problem if we've confessed or not one. The basic problem that we have with confession is our ability to admit. I knew this would make you. We have an admittance problem. Carl Spurgeon says that. About this. He says, learn in confession to be honest with God. Learn in confession to be honest with God. Do not give fair names to foul sin. Call them what you will, they will smell no sweeter. Sometimes we need to elaborate or feel like we need to dress it up a little bit so it doesn't sound quite as bad as it is. You know what? Here's the thing. God already knows. Why would we try to dress it up? And when I'm saying confession, I'm not saying that we all just need to get in a big room and just spill all our dirty laundry and tell everybody everything. I'm talking about confession before God. Are we honest with him? And what we can easily do is say, well, he already knows everything, so I don't need to tell him. Just read right here, it says, if we confess, he is faithful. It doesn't say he needs us to tell him. Notice he doesn't need us to tell him. We need to tell him. It's for our benefit. Turn in confession to be honest with God, not give fair name to foul sin. We confess it if we acknowledge God is both faithful and just. He will forgive. So if we confess it, then that leads to this other thing that we struggle with. This little thing called repentance. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. That doesn't mean it's annoying. It really just means change of mind. You say, well, these people just changed their mind that Jesus wasn't Messiah, so is that that's not exactly right. There are actually elements of repentance that I want to talk about real quick. It says in Luke chapter 3 that repentance is for the forgiveness of sin. Here's the first problem with forgiveness. We first have to come to an understanding we are in need of it. Right? If we can't 
confess, if we can't admit or acknowledge that we have wrongdoing or sin in our lives, we don't even know that we need forgiven for it. This is the big problem that we have when we're an unregenerate heart. We don't know that we need a Savior, but we don't look for Him. If you don't know you're lost, you don't know you need directions. <clears throat> Repentance in action actually becomes a hatred for the sin we once loved and a love for the righteousness we It's a humble and sincere confession of our need of grace. David has a great example of this. If you want to read the entire 51st Psalm, but I'm just going to read a couple of verses. He writes this, Have mercy according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my truth. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me sin. And he goes on for another 17 verses. This is right after he's had his great sin with Bathsheba. The prophet Nathan has brought it to his attention that he was in error because he had done all these things denied it. And he went through the whole list of the things that we, first he tried to hide it, couldn't do that, and he came up with more problems. It just it perpetuates itself. But he came to a place of absolute repentance, crying out grace and mercy. There's three areas of our lives that are affected by a repentance, and you can probably guess them. It's mental, emotional, and spiritual. So mentally, it's actually a, a physical, intellectual change. We start to think differently. And we've talked about this many times in Romans 12, 1 and 2, when it talks about not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. In other words, by thinking differently. It talks about in Scripture having the mind of Christ and that we're to bring all thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Why would our thoughts be so important? Because our thoughts can lie to us. We need the mind of Christ. We need to think differently. We need to think the way. Emotionally, a sincere and genuine repentance is accompanied by sorrow or remorse for what we do. Spiritually, it becomes a determination to surrender our disobedience, our rebelliousness towards God. It's the word that we wrestle with. It's submitting It's mental, emotional, and spiritual. Spurgeon says this too. If you haven't read Spurgeon, I recommend it. He says, many are stung by nettles. Many are stung by nettles, but few are taught by them. In other words, we can have all of these issues in our lives that cause pain, but we don't learn from it. And we just go on and we get stung again and stung again problem is it's not always just internal. It's not just us. But there's collateral damage that goes with it. We're to confess it. We're to repent from it. And then actually, here's one of the worldly ways that we deal with it that I think works if we deal with it the right way. Seek validation from others. Instead of saying, I'm right, right? Or this is my side of the story, and this is the only side you're going to get, and so you're going to lean my direction because you're going to see how unfair this situation was to me. What if we just had someone in our lives that would say, am I looking at this from a godly perspective? Do you know any scripture that deal with this? See, it's, it's looking for support and validation, but it's not just for my side. It's an open-ended, I need you to examine this the same way I need to examine it. And this is what John is really getting to. 
the end of this passage, to live apart from it. Live apart from it. It says in 1 John, this is 2, 5, whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is Keeping God's word. And we've said this many times, one of the problems with keeping his word is knowing it. It's hard to keep it if we don't know what he says. <clears throat> Remember that 45-minute window we've got before we start believing our own lies? We need to get to God's word as soon. Test it against his word, not against what we think it says. Okay, there's a big difference there too that we need to be very careful with because sometimes whether we've been in a church setting for most of our lives or whether we're brand new to it, we have preconceived notions of what God says before we even get into His Word. I could give you several examples, but this is just one of them, and you all can check me out and see if I'm remembering this correctly just off the top of my head. Most people who have been around um, Scripture and I've heard the creation story, will agree that it says that God walked in the cool of the day in the garden. Do I remember it that way? I mean, if you ask, did God walk in the cool of the day in the garden with Adam and Eve? Most Christians or people who have been around Scripture would say, yeah, that's what it says. Exactly what it says. After Adam and Eve committed their sin and the fall, they were hiding from God and they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, did he walk in the garden with them and accompany them in the cool of the day? I think he probably did, but that's not what Scripture says. Exactly. You follow my point? We need to be careful what we think God's Word says and we need to set all that aside Look at his word. See what it says. We need to keep his word. Second John. <clears throat> I'm just going to read you a couple of verses. Second John. I'm just going to read verse 5 and 6. This is the elder writing to the elect lady and her children in this house church, and he says this, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though we were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Remember they're going through this trial where people are trying to draw them, actively and aggressively draw them away from the faith, convince them that Jesus is not who he says he is. He's not who they believe he is. And he says, listen, we've got one commandment, and you need to abide by it. It's love one another. Verse 6, he says this, and this is love. Let me just say this aside. One thing I love about Scripture, it's like I said when I came up, right? The, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, right? I love it when Scripture says something, and right when I'm asking the question in my brain, he answers it. So he says, love one another. And so in my brain, I'm thinking, okay, well, what's that look like? He tells us. This is love, that we walk according to His commandment. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Okay, well, that brings up another question. Okay, so you said that love is walking in His commandments. Now i got another question, Lord. What's it mean to walk in His commandments? Walking translates to occupied by. Have you ever been occupied by something? The exclusion of everything else around you? Saying God's commandments should occupy. Should occupy our thoughts. Should occupy our lives. You all know, um, maybe a fervent football fan. We all know some of them, right? I used to be one. It'd be hard for me to care much less about it now. Don't judge me. But we know these people that know all the stats. I used to know them, right? You know all the players. You know the stats. You know you're doing all the preoccupied by, right? 
now as I'm getting older, I've only got a limited amount of space in my brain, so I have to delete some things so I can put others in. Football was one of those things I had to delete, right? There's nothing wrong with football. I'm not saying football is sinful, but there can be a sinful occupation by it. What if we were as fervent about chasing God's word as we are about chasing entertainment? Headline of who married who or who's divorcing who or honestly that doesn't affect my life rate my knowledge or misunderstanding of God's word definitely it's the important thing to walk according to his commandments means to be occupied be filled with it to be focused on it world say this and this is not a news flash we're almost done the world seeks to convince us that we do not need a savior have you noticed that the world tries to they're doing exactly what this group that left the early church in Ephesus is doing they're trying to convince us that we don't need him Jesus isn't who you think he is you don't even need him to tell us things like you you deserve it. You do you. Or I see this one a lot. You are enough. We are not enough. That's the whole point. Only enough that we have is Jesus Christ. He is enough. The Word shows us over and over this truth that we are in desperate need of a Savior. That's this season. Okay, here's where we tie all this into Christmas. It's this season that we get to celebrate God's perfect plan to give us everything that we were unable to. That's what the birth of Christ is. That's what Christmas is. It's about the gift, the ultimate gift that we were given because we are not he is he sent his only and perfect son to be born in the humblest of conditions to live a life free of sin something that we cannot do to sacrifice himself to pay our debt of sin and give us exactly what we do not deserve it's grace that's what christmas is we celebrate this season as the ones who are most unworthy to receive mercy and kindness. There's not one of us worthy. Not. Yet it's the ones most unworthy, the very ones he came for. Let us not forget. Let's not become occupied by the things of the world. Let's not convince ourselves things are true that they're not. Let us submerge ourselves. Let us be occupied. Let us walk in His command. Let us love one another. Celebrate our Redeemer together. At the end of this chosen pilot that we watched, the shepherd just kept saying this one phrase, I can't get out of my mind. He said, the people. I'm telling you. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful to you. We thank you for this time, this season that we celebrate. God, we understand that it's not a particular day. We can't narrow that down. And God, I just pray that we wouldn't argue over details, Father. Just focus on the purpose. And we're so grateful for the gift of salvation that came from Son Jesus. And may we never forget mercy, grace. 
and why we would be so overjoyed and grateful to tell everyone. God, we honor you. We're so grateful to you. We love you. Yeah. <clears throat>